Take your Bible and turn to James chapter 5. I was there Wednesday night. We're going to pick up a little bit, and I want to talk about prayer. I have been talking about a man by the name of Elijah on uh, Sunday nights, and we're going to talk about him too, but he is mentioned by the half-brother of Jesus, James. So we're going to talk about him. Appreciate Mark for taking, doing such a wonderful job this morning. You've already told me how great a job he did. Appreciate you. We were down at the Georgia-Florida game yesterday. Um, that thing about season tickets, you buy those things ahead of time. And to go to the Georgia-Florida game, you have to put in for those. You don't know that you're going to get them or not, but when they give them to you, you pay for them. Y'all got that? So we, uh, we went. The couple that went with us, their car broke down on the way back. But um, I decided we would sleep in, come in today. You would not have wanted me to drive all night and try to preach this morning. Mark would have done a much better job. So I'm very grateful, very grateful. In James chapter 5, these are some words that you've heard many times. To the point, when you hear words so many times, I'm not sure that they have not lost the significance of the message. Many of you probably have memorized scripture. And from time to time in your life, because you had it memorized, you could bring it quickly up and it could be an encouragement to your soul. Or it could be the promise that you needed to claim. And it's, this, is, this is James settling down at the end of the epistle to tell us some things that are drastically needful and important. And, and he's talking to us believers. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ tonight, this is promises from God for you. These are some things that he has practiced as he has lived. Now, I said that to tell you this. We know that James, the half-brother of Jesus, we know he was the, the leader of the church in, in Jerusalem after the apostles, the disciples, were scattered abroad because of the persecution. But I want to remind you, maybe you've heard this, maybe you've never heard this, but he had a nickname. Anybody know what James' nickname was? Camel Knees. Wonder what that comes from. The calluses on the knees where he would spend so much time on his knees. Just think about that. Here is a man who in his daily life didn't say, oh, I'm supposed to pray in the morning. I'm supposed to have my, my, my prayer over the meals. I'm, I'm supposed to, to pray in the afternoon. Let me gather together in the hour of prayer in the evening and have prayer. Let me pray a, a, a word of thank you to the Lord before we go to bed at night. This is not even a person who wants to do a John 15, abide in me and I in you, for without, me, for without you I can do nothing. This is not even that type of prayer. I believe that we pray because we should, amen? I believe that we pray when we feel need. I believe that we are, are people who, who are scheduling times of prayer because if you don't schedule it, time can go by. I, I do believe that we are people who will have a, an abiding sense of prayer, listening to the still small voice of God when he calls us into that close time of relationship. But, but understand there's other times that, that people are knocked to their knees because of either a burden or joy. This is more than just being at your chair in your house and being comfortable and feeling that urgency so you get out of your chair real quick, find your place to your knees, if you still can, get down on your knees, and, and say in a prayer. But this is having that urgent need all the time. I'm not there. Can I say this? I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not there. Maybe days, certain days, but... I, I wish that I was more there. I mean, there are times in my heart that I long to talk to my wife, and I've got the phone, and I can just call her. Praise God, we've got the cell phones. That's one good thing about them. 
But yet, prayer that we can do with God, we can do that anytime. Now, I'm going to say this again, and we're going to look at this scripture. James was known to be constantly going to God, constantly in deep prayer, constantly sharing his heart until, until he felt the release because of burdens and joy. Not just burdens and also not just joy, but both and. James chapter 5, verse number 13. Is anyone among you suffering in anguish, in anxiety, afflicted, I believe is the King James word? Is anyone here going through hard time? Now, remember his audience that he's speaking to, where Christians are being persecuted, where it's free game. You know, in, in America today, you can be a part of any other religion, and, and everybody's just going to let you just do whatever, say whatever. But if you're a Christian, they feel like they have the right to belittle you, speak down against you. But this is more than that. This is more than just someone saying an unkind word. This means you've got a target on you. And it, the world may have a target on you, but I promise you, our enemy... The Lord's enemy has a target on you. And let me remind you, if you are seeking spiritual renewal in your life, if you're seeking an anointed revival, if you're looking for more of God and less of you, and God wants to come in and move in a mighty way, that will wake Satan up. I was teaching a Sunday school class, and we started to uh, a 13-week study on soul winning. Now, y'all know what I mean when I talk about soul winning, Don. Okay. Just caring for souls and, and loving on souls, telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can heal a soul. He's the only one who can break a broken heart. He's the only one who can cleanse us from our sins. It's just doing for others what someone has done for us, caring for them into the kingdom. They wanted to do this, and I warned them. I gave them the, the, the up front. I said, listen here, if you want to, to talk about how to lead other people to Jesus, understand you're going to be enemy number one. And honest to goodness, before that 13 weeks was up, I don't remember what week it was, somewhere around week eight or nine, we, we talked for the first 20 minutes of the class about everything that had been going on in everybody's life. And, and I don't mean this in a rude statement, but all hell was breaking loose in our lives. Things that we could have never expected any other way. That's the suffering that he's talking about. That's the suffering. People lying, exaggerating, gossiping trying to hurt you in your business, trying to divide you with friends. All of those things that bring anguish to your heart, anybody ever gone through that? If you're not going through it, you will go through it. That's just part of this thing of life. There is good and evil. The good can overcome the evil, praise God, but the evil will always attack the good. He says, are you suffering? Are you afflicted? Well, if you are, what does it say? Look there, verse 13. Pray. Pray. Is anyone cheerful? Anybody happy? I said that before I got a bigger. Are you still happy? After I started preaching, you're not happy anymore. Then what should you do if your heart has been blessed by a holy God? Praise Him. If you're knocked to your knees with a burden, 
pray. But if your heart is overflowing with joy, let it go. Sing. Y'all ever, how many happy hummers do we have in the building tonight? Y'all know what I'm talking about? A happy hummer? Big pardon? Are you a hummer, Melba? You know, there's, there's, there's two groups. There's either the grumblers. And then there's the hummers. Maybe some are doing it on tune, some are not doing it on tune. I don't know what the deal is. But if, here it is. Where you are in life, give God, give God whatever it is. If you've got a burden, give it to God. If you've got a blessing, give it to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So maybe it's the blessing of suffering. Count it all joy. Give it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Leave it there. Take your burden of your heart. Take the things that, that are just absolutely just, just driving you down and let him have them. But if you have joy, let him have that too. Anyone among you sick? Have y'all seen our prayer list? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I know I say this a lot, but let me, let me please say this one more time. Please hear this. If you don't hear this well, you're going to think I said something wrong. God, let me say it correctly. Not every sin, not every sickness, excuse me, not every sickness is because of sin. But some sicknesses are caused by sin. Now, if you're one of those that you've seen them out there and there's some, something's going on in someone's life and they'll say, well, I wonder what they did. Be very, very careful. We're not the judge. Not at all. You see someone going through something, don't you gossip about them. Don't you say something negative about them. You love them in Jesus' name and you pray for them. You pray blessings upon them. You pray, pray healing upon them. But James is talking to a specific group here in the church that have been going through some things in their life. Most of the scholars that are looking at this particular passage, they think that there's something going on in their life that is caused by an activity of their life. So he says, call for the elders of the church. Now, let me just be very honest. Do you, Pastor, do you believe that if someone has a sickness, you can call for me and, and we will pray specifically over you? Amen, amen, and amen. We don't do it enough. We don't do it enough. If you've got something you want me to pray over, stop me in the, in the aisle. Stop, call me up. I'll pray with you on the phone. I will meet with you. We will do this. Do you believe in anointing oil? I understand that, that it was a medicinal thing for them, but I also understand that all the way through Scripture, it was symbolic. And my prayers are to God, but I'm asking God to do what I can't do. If I could heal you, I would. But I know the one who can. And I believe in answered prayer. So if you want to come and, and, and if the oil, of the oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit of God, I want to put it in God's hands and I will anoint you and I will pray over you and, and I will expect God to do that which is best. I believe in the prayers of God's people. Amen? But he, because he is bringing in the elders here, they think that there may be more involved in that. I said that to say this, you can pray over people too. If you, if you covet my prayers, I'm good with that. Please trust me, I'm not trying to get out of anything. I'm going to pray anyway. I believe in that. Just as if you called me, I called you and said, would you please pray for me? Because I covet your prayers, I would expect you to do that. I'll do the same for you. 
but there's nothing extra spiritual about me. I got the same Holy Spirit in me that you got in you. Can you, if I had not just come back from the game, I'd have my anointing oil in my pocket, right? And, and I've had people ask me all the different things. What, do we use this? Is it olive oil? Is that, look, let me tell you what I do. You do, don't use 20W40. <laughs> no. But they say, is it olive oil? Well, it's olive oil based. If you want to use olive oil, amen. It's, it's a symbol. But there is in Leviticus an actual recipe for the anointing oil. And it has spices in it. Now, I know that Brother Mark and I were talking last week about the different Christian bookstores that were in Gainesville. Brother Mark, you said there were four? And now we're down to what? And, and can I just say, God help us? You know, they, they had businesses here because they were making money. And for some reason, they stopped making money. Maybe it's because of things being online. I don't know. I don't want to pass judgment. But, but you can find it online if you don't mind ordering things. If, if it were my preference, I, what I would tell you, if you're going to anoint someone and you want to go to the kitchen and get some olive oil, amen, that's fine. But if you're going to do it scripturally, there is a recipe there. I'm not going to make it for you. But people who know how to make it for and my goodness, it smells wonderful. Brother Jimmy's shaking his head. You know what I'm talking about? Brother Mark, you've got I, it, that, that cinnamon smell that's in it is amazing. It's amazing. So literally all that you do is you anoint them and you pray over them. Now, maybe I, I said a lot there, but let me get to the important part of it, okay? It's not just the symbolism. That's important. By the way, we shouldn't make small of something that God put in there for a significant purpose. It may be symbolism, but if he thought it was important, he put it in there, then let's follow it. Are y'all good? He says, the prayer of faith will save the sick. The thing is, is I'm just not sure that we believe that anymore. I believe that we think that we should pray the prayer of faith because it's the right thing to do. But the difference between the prayer of faith will save the sick and the prayer of faith is because the right thing it should do changes the outcome. Let's look at what God's Word says. And the Lord will raise him up. Who does the healing? He's the only one who can. Let me pause here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Because he is the one who gave us the access. I could not speak to the Father unless I go through his Son. Right? So if I'm going to the Father, I'm going to pray through Jesus. And God raised Jesus up. So I am going through the intercessor. Jesus prays for us. John chapter 5 says Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing. So literally what we're doing when we're going through Jesus is we're finding the perfect will of God. Now if you go back to a verse number 12, he talks about when you make a pledge, you don't make it in, in, by your oath. You can say, I swear to God. Does that mean that God has to answer because you said that? Well, in he for heaven's sake, as God is my witness, is that supposed to make my words more powerful because I use those? He says, no, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. But when we come through Jesus, we're claiming the power of Christ and we're, pl we're praying, listen, are you listening? The will of God. So 
I don't know if it's God's will to heal in that circumstance or not. I have a sovereign God who knows more than I do. So when I pray through Christ, believing and trusting, I'm getting to the Father so that God's will can be done on earth just as it's done in heaven. So when the Father amens it, Jesus only sees what he what only does what he sees the Father doing. So when we go through Jesus, we're going to get God's perfect will. And he's going to send it back through. And the power of Christ will come alive. The power of Christ that is always effective will come alive. And if God says no, then he knows best. Paul was preaching kind of like me, and he got long-winded, and somebody fell out of a window and got, bam, died. He went down there, and the God of resurrection healed him back up. We need to put good guardrails on the balcony back there, right? That was God raising him back up. When Jesus delayed going to see Lazarus, it was because he didn't want to heal a sickness. He wanted to raise one from the dead. God's choice in the circumstance. Whatever would bring the Father more glory in the circumstance. When John the Baptist was beheaded, I promise you there were prayers of good people for John the Baptist to release. But the greatest glory was John the Baptist, even though it was not God's will for that evil woman, that ugly woman, Herodias, to be asking for what she asked for. But yet God could see beyond what Satan meant for evil. God could do good. And God, listen now, allowed that. Now, if I was praying for John to be released, but God's will was for that he to be a martyr, right? To get out of the way so Jesus could be in the way. God's will be done. So what I'm looking for is God's best when I pray. But hear this. What if I am not looking for God's best, I'm looking for what I want? What if I'm not looking for His glory, I'm looking for my glory? What if I'm not looking for His will, I'm looking for my want? And what if God wanted to heal, but I came as an unworthy vessel? You ever thought about that? You see, my responsibility is to put it in his, his will. But my responsibility is I have a personal part of this too. If you come to me and you ask me to pray for this, I need to make sure that my life is right because I do not want to have anything in my life that will hinder the prayers. If Lynn and I are fussing, my prayers will be hindered. That's Scripture. Y'all pray we have a wonderful relationship. If you are disobedient, but then you want to step out of your disobedience and pray the prayer of faith, there's dissonance in your life. Let's talk about this. Verse number 16. Now hold on, let me get the very end of verse 15. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I don't care who you are. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's a promise of God that settles it. So verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. How many of y'all have a prayer partner other than your spouse? Was that true? Or did y'all not want to raise your hand? All right. Find somebody. 
You need to have somebody other than your spouse that you can tell anything to. You need to have somebody that you can call on them any day, any time, and say, hey, 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 right now, drop to your knees. I need your prayers. We're becoming too private of a people. Uh, I'm not going to pick out that person for you. You get the privilege of picking out that person for yourself. Let's get humble. We're in need. And if what I just saw is true, we're not obeying Scripture. I'll be very, very honest with you. Uh, the guy that I just went to the ball game with, his name is Jeff Freeman. I've known him for 30 years. Other than my wife, he knows more about me than anybody else. I can call Jeff anytime. He has never judged me that I know of. He has always stood right by my side, no matter anything. Now, he's not the only one I have. But he's, he's my brother. Matter of fact, he's closer than my blood. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another. All right. I wasn't expecting this. You need, to have, you need to go find that person, and you need, you're need you probably all dealing with some stuff, and you need to get that, you need to talk to the Lord about it, but you need to have somebody there hold you accountable. Somebody that will pray with you about those situations. Maybe this is the, maybe this is the area of prayer that our church needs to go. Please don't be prideful about this. This is scripture, folks. Go to them. I know that the Lord hears your prayers. But God says, we're not in this alone. I have two sides of me. I, I have a very public side, and I'm very extroverted. I'm not a, I never get a, afraid. I'm never scared in the pulpit. I don't get nervous. I'll say anything to anybody. It, I, I'm very extroverted. But I also have a very introverted side of me that y'all don't see. Is that not right, Lynn? Extremely. I, I can be very public, but I also step out of that, and I need that. And that's who God made me. And I'm not trying to hide something. That's just who I am. If, if I was extroverted all the time, my batteries would run out. I, I have to pull back. I have a tractor. Did y'all know that? And I love to bush hog. Me and Jesus just tearing it up in Jesus' name. I love to mow the grass. I love to do things with my hands. I love to walk, when I, and I look forward to doing it again. Have that time. But I also have to know that Trevor right there, I'll call him on stuff. That's a godly young man. God's doing a great work in his life. And I made a commitment that I'm going to pour into that young man. And I'm going to hold him accountable. And any, I think any time, he knows he can come tell me anything. Wasn't expecting to say this tonight, church. Either you were being humble or we got a deficit here we, I didn't even know about. We better. Girls, you need girls. And I don't mean just to go shopping with. If it's been a while that you have talked with someone and unloaded and got some stuff off of your chest, maybe a four or five Kleenex conversation, it might be too long. I'm going to say the last part of verse 16 and I'm going to stop. I didn't even get to the part that I was looking at. The last part of verse 16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 
Here's the grammar of this. Effective, fervent in the Greek is one word. E-N-E-R-G-E-O. Can you think of the English word that we got trans transliterated over? E-N-E-R-G. Energy. Energy. And this word means to overcome with power, but it means to do it effectively. There's great power hooked up to this building, but if they didn't wire it right, we'd be in a heap of trouble. But when it's done right and done effectively, and the power of that, depending on the size wire, how much power can go through, amazing things can happen. But if the wires are disconnected, it doesn't matter how much power is available. It's not effective. And if there's something blocking it, the effective fer fervent prayer of a Have you ever been in a place where you tried to get to somebody but there were too many things in the way? That was me yesterday evening. I was trying to leave that stadium and there were 70,000 people ahead of me. And my feet feel pretty good, but they didn't last night because it took so long to get out. I just wanted them to get out of the way. Look, if I am in a place of need, I want to be able to call on someone who I know has... We use this terminology, a direct line, a hotline. And really what we're talking about there is somebody that doesn't have a lot of junk in the way. Somebody that in their walk with God is confessed up. Somebody that's seeking God's will. Somebody that is believing. Somebody that is full of faith. Somebody that's trusting God in their walk, not talking it, but actually doing it in their walk. Those are the ones you want to grab a hold of. So literally every day, that's where we need to be in our walk with God, is we need to say, what in my life can be a hindrance from God using me? What is in the way what is interfering? Is it a belief? Is it an action? Is it a habit? What is keeping me from being that person? Listen, God hears prayers. And praise God, every prayer that he hears, he hears through the grace of God. We would have nothing if it were not for his grace. And if his mercy were not, not there, he would... He would judge us but God wants to do a work in us he's not looking for the perfect person he's looking for the person who is willing to trust him believe him and because of that they are seeking to do what is right in their life if you're in open rebellion God's word will not return void but you could be interfering in the process the affectionate, fervent prayer, energy of a righteous man does much. By the way, I could tell you a righteous woman just as much. Gender neutral. Do we need to pray? Here's the invitation. We're not going to have a public invitation. We're not going to have a come forward invitation. Can I say, church... Let's do a few things. Number one, if you don't have someone that is your prayer partner, and it doesn't count if you hadn't called on them to pray in a long time. If you've got a prayer partner that y'all aren't praying together, and you're not sharing together, you, let's say let's update the list. Go to the same person, but let's update it. And let's start praying together. Call them. If they don't call you, call them. 
how can I pray for you? Let's start looking. Lord, what in my life is keeping my prayers from being heard? What actions do I need to be doing in my life? What needs to be done? Lord, I want to live this type of life. When we get into the next two verses, we're going to talk about a man by the name of Elijah. I'll probably talk about this next Sunday night. I don't know. Wouldn't it be amazing for God to say, we need to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. Ed, you're the one. This is what I want you to do. Or in your life. Is there anybody in here so young that God won't hear your prayers? Anybody in here so old that God won't hear your prayers? I guess we'll work. We'll do. Greatest privilege. Burdens or joy, either one. Take them to the Lord. Sir, I wasn't expecting this tonight. So, Lord, um, if this is the area of need that we have, you're going to have to confirm it with the hearts that are here, and you're going to have to bring that burden upon them. Father, if they walk away without a burden, they're not going to do anything. But, Lord, if you do give the burden, the burden to pray, the burden to be a prayer warrior, to undergird on behalf of someone else, to have someone in our life that we could call on, Father, I pray that we will do that. Lord, I've asked for prayer partners and nothing happened from it. But Lord, I have dear friends that I know that I could call and say anything to, Lord, and I know, I know that they would drop to their knees. Father, may we take advantage of this great relationship that you've given us, not just to take us to heaven one day. That's coming. Father, to be able to be useful and be a part of a joint effort that you're doing in this world. Father, you just, however the need is, apply the Holy Spirit personally. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.